So what I found in my research at uh, my website, yourmorals.org, um, my collaborators and I have, uh, have posted surveys there, and a quarter million people have taken our surveys, and the results are fairly consistent, uh, that liberals tend to endorse uh, moral judgments and moral items related to issues of care and compassion, more so than conservatives. Everyone values them, but liberals more. And fairness as a quality, whereas conservatives value fairness as proportionality. People should get what they deserve. If they don't work hard, they should not receive. Um, then there's some other values where conservatives score substantially higher. Group loyalty, respect for authority, and a sense of purity or sanctity. Uh, those are the values that underlie a lot of the religious right and a lot of the cultural issues that we've been dealing with for decades now. Abortion, euthanasia, sexuality, drug use, those sorts of things. So what I try to do in my book and in my public talks is to take people inside the mind of the other side and to show them the kind of world that they want to build. And of course, we each assume we know what the other side wants. They want to destroy the world, kill all the animals, and oppress all the women, for example. Uh, you can guess which side is stereotyped as that. Um, <clears throat> but in fact, what I found from working, studying morality across cultures is that each side has a very positive vision of the world they want to build, and it's usually one that can be understood if it's explained carefully. And so I'm hoping to give people the tools and the conceptual categories to, to give names and labels to what they're trying to do. Um, and one of the big issues I think that, that the left has trouble understanding about the right is that at least social conservatives are trying to uh, uh, restrain individual selfishness and individual individuality such that you can get people to uh, do their duty, carry out their roles, and um, uh, create a, a cohesive moral community. Uh, now, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, so I'm hoping that if people learn more moral psychology, they'll have a different way of thinking about a variety of different political groups, and they'll be able to perhaps still disagree with them, but no longer demonize them, no longer make false assumptions about their motives. Do we live in hyperpartisan times? Yes, absolutely. Uh, there are some people who deny it, and they tend to point back to the 19th century and say, see, things were really bad then. Well, they're right, they were. And then they got a lot better in the mid-20th century. There was a long period, basically, we fight World War I, we fight World War II. Uh, the people who lived through those events were much more cooperative, uh, much better able to cooperate with each other when they took charge of government in the 50s and 60s and all the way into the 70s. Uh, but once we get into the 1980s and 90s, a lot of things change. The change of the generations, uh, most importantly, the, the movement of the South from the, you had Southern conservative Democrats become Southern conservative Republicans. So a number of things changed beginning in the 60s. They really reached fruition in the 80s and 90s. And the graph of polarization, the, the data on polarization in Congress and in the general public go up and up and up. And we are now in by far the most polarized time since the 1890s. It's very difficult uh, to bring the two sides together. It's very difficult to find common ground. There is some common ground. Um, I think perhaps a more fruitful way to go is to focus on common threats. Uh, there are a lot of dangers we face in this country, and each side is right to point to certain threats. It's almost as though there's a whole series of asteroids headed our way. And one side is saying, look, global warming, it's going to destroy us. And they're right, and the other side is not listening. But the conservatives are saying, Fiscal entitlements, entitlement spending. We've been screaming about this since the 60s. We're saying great society's gonna bankrupt us. And it turns out they were right. And the liberals weren't listening. So, and then there's other threats. that Rising, rising uh, inequality. Huge, huge problem. The left's been screaming about it for decades. The right doesn't listen. Family dissolution. It's a real problem. It's really bad when kids don't have fathers and they, they move around and men cycle into the family. It's terrible. The right's been screaming about that for decades and the left wouldn't listen. So. I'm thinking of starting a thing called the Asteroids Club, in which uh, we talk about all these asteroids headed our way. They're going to destroy our country. And, and if we see that there are lots of asteroids coming, maybe we can make a deal. And I think the motto of the group might be something like, I'll help you deflect your asteroids if you help me deflect mine. Uh, I think we can possibly work together, together better if we talk about common threats than if we search for common ground. 
Social media is fascinating and really relevant to our, our current problems and, and situations, uh, but in complex ways that I think we, we can't yet know how they're going to play out. The one thing I can say for sure as a person who studies moral psychology is that we, we tend to use our, our reasoning to find evidence for what we want to believe. This is called the confirmation bias. People are terrible at, at searching for evidence on both sides. So social media and Google and the internet more generally makes it effortless to find confirmation for whatever crazy thing you want to believe. You know, if you want to believe that a fetus can feel pain at four months, just Google it, you'll find somebody saying it. If you want to believe that uh, uh, a woman who's raped uh, can't get pregnant, just Google it, you'll find somebody saying it. So social media certainly enables all kinds of crazy paranoid beliefs. But it also does bring people together in complicated ways that we're not, we're, you know, we don't know how this is going to play out. So my guess is that right now it's exacerbating our partisan divide, uh, but I, I think it, it might ameliorate it in, in some ways, in some instances. Uh, there are a number of groups around the country that are working on bipartisanship, on finding common ground, on common values, on bridging the divide. And they tend to be composed of very well-meaning liberals who often have one center-right Republican um, who was part of the founding group. And then they try to get members on both sides, but it tends to be sort of center-left folks who, who come out for these events. Uh, I think there are a lot of reasons for this. One is that uh, there's data showing that uh, on left and right, people's attitudes and trust in government fluctuate. And right now, the Republicans, they were actually at a 40-year high under Bush. They have now plummeted to a 200-year low. They, 5% of Republicans trust the government to do what's right, some or most of the time nowadays. So Republicans are, are so hostile to the government now that a lot of them have just sort of just checked out. Um, but also I think the very idea of can't we all get along, can't we bridge our divides, that's a liberal value. The John Lennon song, imagine, imagine there's no heaven, imagine there's no countries, imagine all the people living life in peace. That does tend to attract a lot more liberals than conservatives. In the long run, what we need to do is change our institutions. We need to change the way elections are run so that extremists don't get in. More, more reasonable candidates are, are nominated in the primaries. We need to change rules in Congress. There's a, there are, there's a whole, there, there's so many wonderful books coming out now uh, listing the fixes that we need to do, especially at the national level. But there's a lot that we can do as individuals. Uh, there's a lot we can learn to do. We can learn ways of talking to other people. Um, we can come together in ways that foster relationships. Um, the, key to, the key to opening your mind is opening your heart. We're not going to listen to somebody if we feel negatively towards them. So I think places like the Bob Graham Center uh, can do a world of good by creating situations in which people get to know each other, build relationships, and don't talk about politics at first. Only after you develop some trust, some personal relationship, can you begin to talk about politics? Because now you might be willing to listen. If you don't have the relationship, somebody says something, you're just going to have your inner lawyer jump in and say, you know, objection, you say this, but why did George Bush do that? So um, I think organizations and, and centers like Bob Graham um, can bring people together and they can use technology to sort of circumvent some of our normal uh, moral defenses. and. Uh, um, uh, kind of broker some peace and, and create some relationships.